Today I saw a story that confirms what I already know, but want to share with you guys, and that is the condo crisis is still alive and well, and it will continually get worse. And you can mark my word on that, because now I'm starting to see stories of people asking questions like, well, my condo put forward a big special assessment and uh, you know a lot of people in the building don't have enough money to pay you know and the reserves are not there to pay for this so times are tight for us and for our neighbors you know what happens if somebody's unable to pay a large special assessment that's the question right now that condo owners are asking themselves what happens if I can't pay the special assessment well the short answer is if you can't pay the condo association is eventually going to end up foreclosing on your unit and you're going to lose your place just like if you stopped paying your mortgage but if we rewind a little bit and take a step back and figure why is this all of a sudden a problem why were people able to pay the special assessments before or you know not have you know big issues with this until recently well just like everything else inflation and the cost of living has shot through the roof and made everything costs way more than what most people can afford that is now being translated over into the fees people have to pay to maintain their condominium because expenses on everything have risen so exponentially recently when you're talking about utilities when you're talking about insurance even just having a general repair done on the condo that you live in all those expenses have gone up exponentially okay so the HOA fees have to increase but on top of that if the condos don't have enough money in their reserve account in order to pay for a big project that needs to be done they need to levy a special assessment basically what that is it's an additional payment on top of your regular monthly HOA fee that you need to pay and if you don't pay it they can foreclose on your unit be a lien against your property at some point point. and there's a couple different reasons why you're seeing so much of this problem crop up now versus before one of the main reasons is because so many buildings have a lot of deferred maintenance that they never took care of for decades and decades and ever since we saw the Champlain Tower collapse a couple years ago this brought to light the fact of how many buildings are grossly under maintained it started off as a Florida problem with how much condo fees and expenses started going up but has spread to other parts of the country I've made numerous videos here on the channel highlighting different stories that you guys have sent me from condo fees going up all over the place in Arizona in Colorado in Missouri you name it it's going up there now the common advice is if you can't pay your special assessment then you need to talk to your property manager immediately and let them know you're having financial troubles to see if there's some kind of payment plan that can be worked out often what I've seen with special assessments is they'll give you the chance to pay it all in one lump sum or a few large payments or for people that really can't afford it and need to finance that expense they have financing available you know like the last one in my building for example was a finance uh, special assessment for five years guys so five years paying this special special assessment luckily the interest rates were low at the time we secured that it's only like a three percent interest rate but now if condos have to go through these special assessments and they need to secure financing for it you can guarantee that the interest rates are going to be much higher than three percent so therefore making that special assessment even more expensive for people who can't really afford it and here's the problem guys if you don't pay on top of the special assessment then you'll also be starting to get hit with legal fees and fines from the association for not paying like late fees and things like that and ultimately it's going to add up to being even more expensive than the actual special assessment itself so not paying doesn't do you any favors I actually love walking by golf courses because even though I don't golf it's so peaceful by golf courses you know they got all this open space here and it's just beautiful I might have to start golfing <laughs> but the other reason you're starting to see so many special assessments now is because repairs and problems with different buildings can only be delayed for so long guys and the problem is they've been delayed to the point of disrepair for some buildings or to the point now where they need to make these massive special assessments in hopes of fixing them and it's coming at really a really bad time because 
the cost of everything costs more than ever than before. So if they would have fixed it, say five years ago, the same problem probably would have cost 40% less to fix than it's gonna cost today. But now, since everybody decided it was a good idea to wait until forever to fix all these problems, it's bankrupting people. And one thing that I'm personally seeing right now just throughout Miami and where I live is you're starting to see more and more condos go up for sale because a couple of things are happening. We're getting closer and closer to the 2025 deadline of when starting the beginning of next year, all of these condos here in Florida are gonna be required to have full reserves. No more no reserves, no more partial reserves, full reserves. And that in many cases, people are gonna see their maintenance fees and their condos go up double or triple, guys. I know that for a fact, because I know a lot of these buildings here and I know how bad a financial shape that they're in. And yes, guess what? That, that's only related to the HOA fee. You know, that HOA fee is gonna go up double or triple just to start building up the reserves that they need to have required by law. But that doesn't even include any potential special assessments that they might need to levy for anything in addition to that. So the situation is dire to say the least. What I've also seen firsthand is it's disproportionately affecting obviously lower income and elderly people because they're also they're on a fixed income in many cases or don't work anymore or whatever. And even in my own building, I have seen several older couples sell their units and leave because they cannot afford to keep up with the expenses anymore. I don't blame them, you know? I would do the same thing if it was just becoming too much and I couldn't afford it either. Luckily, that's not the case. And I'm realistic, guys. Like, I know that none of this is gonna be cheap. Like, I'm either gonna pay to maintain the condo that I'm in or I'm gonna be paying in another form to maintain a house I move into. So either way, you end up paying, you know, maintenance for a property, okay? There's no two ways around it. I've owned several investment properties, houses, by the way, duplexes, and guess what? They all require maintenance. So it doesn't matter what type of real estate you own, it's guaranteed you're gonna have to sink money into it. But the other problem is, say you're an investor here, right? And you bought a condo that used to cash flow nicely, but now with all the rising costs and assessments with these buildings, you can no longer turn a profit. And guess what a lot of investors are now doing? They are selling. And that's one of the reasons you're starting to see inventory for condos pick up everywhere, not just in Florida, guys. It is exploding here. I'm gonna do a whole video probably next week or something on the amount of inventory here in Florida that is just skyrocketing right now. But let's face it, you know, Florida's always been a highly speculative market and a lot of these condos are owned by investors and the moment they stop turning a profit, they're dumping them. Now, one thing that's likely to make some condos even more expensive for people, but not just condos, this applies to all real estate in Florida, is a new bill that's being proposed right now, Senate Bill 1716, would basically force a lot of people that have a second home here in Florida that currently have an insurance policy with citizens to switch over to a more traditional insurance company. And what they call them is surplus line carriers. And surplus line carriers are regulated differently in Florida than traditional insurance companies. Basically, they don't need approval on rate increases. So they can charge whatever they want. So that's gonna increase the cost tremendously for people that own second homes here, which could be yet another source of coming inventory to the market, which I've been talking about for a long time now. But these surplus line carriers also do not have access to the Florida Hurricane Catastrophe Fund. So if one of these insurance companies goes bankrupt and there's a major storm, the state's not gonna come in and bail them out. That's it, they're, like, they're finished, guys. But they say, don't worry about that because a lot of these surplus line carriers have a larger surplus than many domestic carriers, so it's not a big deal. Well, it's not gonna be a big deal until the next category six hurricane comes in and wipes all these people out, right? They say right now it's estimated that between 45 and 60,000 second homes have a Florida citizen's insurance policy. So they could all be forced to switch to a more expensive carrier sooner than later. Imagine if even half of those people decide to sell, that's already an immediate 25, 30,000 new listings on the market on top of 
the exploding inventory we already have. Now, if you guys remember from yesterday's video, one thing that we talked about is how the 90 day plus delinquencies on all forms of debt right now have been skyrocketing except for mortgage delinquencies. They are starting to tick up, but it hasn't skyrocketed like auto loans and, and credit card loans have so far, or at least yet. But that could be slowly starting to change because as of the most recent report from Adam, they just uh, found out that the properties with foreclosure filings in the U.S. rose an additional 33,270 in the month of January, which is up 5% from a year ago. And it's also 10% higher than the month before in December. So just like the layoffs, we're not exactly getting off to the greatest start this year when it comes to how many people are starting to get hit with foreclosure notices at the beginning of this year. So once again, guys, this just continues to prove my theory that people are just barely hanging on right now and more and more are just starting to slip off the edge right now because you cannot continue you know, running a household budget, say if your bills are 5,000 a month and you only bring in 4,000 a month, right? That can only go on for so long and I think that's the position a lot of people find themselves in today. And it's not really through any fault of their own. Yeah, maybe some people are living beyond their means, but you say, you know, that person, maybe they used to earn 3,500 a month, now they earn 4,000 because wages are up, but their expenses used to be 3,000 a month. They weren't really getting ahead before, they were saving 500 bucks a month if they saved the money, but now, it's much worse. They don't even have the opportunity to save that $500 a month anymore. Now they're losing an additional $1,000 a month. And of course, that's just like a made up number just to give an example of how this can look for people right now. And don't get me wrong, guys, we're still nowhere near with the foreclosure filings that we saw during the 2008 housing crash. I'm not, I'm not saying that we are, but what I am saying is that people's finances in general are moving in the wrong direction and because the delinquencies are rising on every other form of debt really except for the foreclosures and the mortgages right now, I think it's just a matter of time before we do see that. Nobody can give you a timeline, including me. I can't say that in you know, another nine months from now is when we're gonna see that really start to tick up. But it's gonna happen at some point if people can't pay their bills. But even the people that work for Adam are saying the same thing. They're saying, listen, this is probably due to people's monthly budgets being increased by inflation. It's because of the resumption of student loan payments. It's because of people have depleted their savings. It's a combination of everything of why you're starting to see more foreclosures come online. Here we have a house that's almost 100 years old, built in 1926 for $3 million. And the last time this house actually sold was in 1985 for 85,000. What a joke, right? Now today, 3 million bucks. And the property tax bill here is still only $12,000 a year, which isn't too bad, I guess, considering your house is worth $3 million. Anybody who buys this house is going to be paying like $30,000 a year. But let's see if they sell. It's been listed since the beginning of October of 2023 with no price cuts yet. They're saying right now the states that are seeing the biggest increase in these foreclosures are Michigan, where it went up 200%. Minnesota, it went up 47%, and in California, it went up 43%. So those are the top three states right now that are experiencing the highest level of increases in foreclosures. But even if there are a lot of people that start going delinquent on foreclosures, it can take a while for these foreclosures to actually make their way into the system, guys, because you know the timeline for how fast a foreclosure can actually go through can vary pretty dramatically, depending on if you live in a judicial or non-judicial foreclosure state, can make a huge difference on the timeline. So for example, if you live in a judicial state, and there's 21 of them, by the way, the lender has to file a lawsuit in order to foreclose on you. So then the homeowner has 30 days to pay their debts, and if they don't, the foreclosure process moves forward. But it can take much longer to foreclose in one of these areas because the foreclosure must move through the state supreme or housing court system. And if the courts are backed up, it can take much longer for all this to happen, which will allow people to just kind of sit there and not pay their mortgage for a long time. But in non-judicial states, it can actually move much faster. Like in California and Texas, for example, when the borrower goes into default, the lender can put the house up for auction right away without filing any legal paperwork. 
And this is much faster than a judicial foreclosure because it doesn't involve the housing courts. And if a lender wants to foreclose on your home in a non-judicial state, it may happen sooner than the 120 day timeline that it usually takes. And interestingly enough, your lender may actually even be influenced by your local market conditions on how fast they want to start the foreclosure proceedings. Because in a strong market where the lender will have no problem getting rid of the property, they may move a lot quicker. So right now, supposedly the housing market's still really strong, right? Inventory is still very low. So there's a high probability that if you're struggling right now and are going into foreclosure, they're gonna move pretty fast, guys, because chances are they're gonna be able to unload that property sooner than later, especially if, there's a, if you're in a market where there's low inventory. And of course, to the contrary, if you're in a slow market where inventory's piling up, just like we saw during the 2008 housing market crash, they can take forever because they know it's gonna take forever to sell the house anyways. So they don't bother moving forward with it with speed. But I think one way in general to kind of make sure that if you're gonna be buying a home, that is gonna be less likely that you'll end up in a foreclosure down the road is just put a higher down payment when you buy a house, guys. But that's not what most people do because the average first time home buyer, they put down 8% in 2023, that's it. 8% down payment. That's not very high or very good versus when you're looking at repeat home buyers, they put down about 19%, so much closer to the 20% down that people think you have to put down in order to buy a house, which is not true, but they put down that higher down payment likely because number one, they're pulling equity from the previous sale of their old house, so they have the money, but also, they realize they've already been down this road before. They've owned a house before and they realize, hey, if I put down a higher down payment, I'm gonna pay off my mortgage faster because my payments will be lower. So chances of me being able to, you know, contribute more principal payments is gonna be higher. Also, I'm not gonna have any private mortgage insurance to pay, which the more expensive your house is, the more expensive that PMI payment will be. And the other problem is people that put a low down payment don't really have any equity, guys, from the very get-go. At least if you put a 20% down payment, you can say right from the very beginning, I own 20% of this house, okay? And so if home prices come down by 10% where you live, you still own 10% of that house. But if you only put down 8% and they come down by 10%, then you own negative 2% of that house. Now you're upside down with what they call that on the mortgage of that property. And the problem is guys, like people put down a lower down payment just to get into a house, you know, like, well, if I try to save, I might not be able to afford a house anymore. I might as well get in now. But like I said, you have that monthly PMI payment that adds to your monthly payment, but also the more of the purchase you finance, the higher your monthly payment is going to be in general. So it kind of sets you up for this situation where you might save a little bit now, but you're going to pay a lot more later in the form of interest, in the form of private mortgage insurance. And in a world where expenses are rising faster than people's incomes, it's not really a good position to be in. And it's probably why we're starting to see such a huge uptick in foreclosures. So you really need to think it through carefully if you know getting into one of these 3% down mortgages or 1% like rocket mortgages offering or one of these things is gonna be good for you or not. Because it might sound appealing, but if you're already being stretched at that 3% down payment, for example, of your affordability and you're already having a hard time affording that house with only 3% down, that's a pretty strong sign you can't afford that house. Now, on the other hand, if you're putting down say 5% or even 8% like the average is here, and that monthly payment falls well within the realm of comfortability for you, and you want to use the rest of that money for opportunity costs, say you're choosing to put down less, you know, and you have another reason to have that money invested somewhere else, then that can be fine. So just like anything else in life, there's no one size fits all, guys. There's no one right or wrong answer to how much you should put down. Everybody has to make that decision on their own. But I think a lot of people recently have just jumped into the housing market and put down as little as possible because they really can't afford to own a house. And now we're starting to see the consequences of that. So 
If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you don't want to wait for my next video to come out, check out this one on the screen right over here. And I'll see you in the next one.